the American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. While CBS ended Gunsmoke on radio in June of 1961, the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service continued to broadcast reruns of radio shows for U.S. troops. Captain Lewis. Hello, Sergeant. In early 1963, they commissioned a series specifically intended for the U.S. and U.N. personnel. And ran into an Indian situation that looked tight for a little while, but you know me, Produced in Studio B of Capitol Records in Hollywood. It was called Horizons West and told the remarkable 8,000-mile journey of Lewis and Clark's expedition in 13 parts. Noble Sir Thomas, the champion of the common man. Good old Mr. Jefferson. He made it. He made it. Huh. Republicans are all alike. No control. What was that, Sergeant? <clears throat> are you criticizing me or Mr. Jefferson? Just giving an opinion, sir. What this country needs is a ruling class. Sergeant, you're an idiot. Three cheers for Tom Jefferson! What's going on here? I'm trying to work. Oh, <clears throat> it's you, Lewis. Yes, sir. The sergeant just told me Mr. Jefferson was elected president. And you're letting everybody know you're friends with him, is that it? I voted for him, if that's what you mean. No, not exactly, Captain. There's a letter for you from him in my office. Come in. A letter from Mr. Jefferson? Looks to me like a personal letter. Well, our families are neighbors in Virginia. Here. It came by special messenger the day before yesterday. Thank you, sir. This is a surprise to hear from him when he's busy taking over such a big job. Well, Captain, good news or bad? Dear Lieutenant Lewis, <laughs> I'll have to tell him I made Captain, huh, sir? In view of my recent election to the presidency of the United States, I find that I will require a private secretary. Your tact and social adaptability, your knowledge of the Western country, of the Army, has rendered it desirable for public as well as private purposes that you should be engaged in that office. If you accept, please obtain approbation from General Wilkinson and repair to the presidential mansion, Washington City. What do you think of that, Colonel? I am to be the new private secretary to the president. I don't understand it, Lewis. You, a secretary? Why not, sir? Look, your written reports are any indication. You don't have a hand. You have a rooster scratch, and you can't spell. Come, Captain. Why would the president want you for a secretary? Very simple, Colonel. He likes me. Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter One. Mr. Jefferson's Dream. Scriptwriters Carl and William Tunberg accurately dramatized the most important events of the voyage. Stage and TV actor John Anderson was chosen to be William Clark, while the role of Meriwether Lewis went to radio veteran Harry Bartell. Sebastian Cabot played Toussaint Charbonneau, and Cliff Holland voiced York. Backing up the leads were well-known West Coast character actors like Herb Ellis, Sam Edwards, Jack Crucian, Les Tremaine, Don Diamond, and Frank Gerstle. Be kept secret as long as possible and would need superlative leadership. After considering a number of young men, Jefferson finally selected the leader, Meriwether Lewis, and had ensured the secrecy of the choice by offering him the job of private secretary to the president. My name is Meriwether Lewis, and I'm making what the colonel has called rooster scratches in my journal. In March of 1801, I was 26 years old, a captain in the 1st Infantry and paymaster for the regiment. I liked Army life, even though being paymaster meant I had to travel constantly through the wilderness parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and along the Mississippi frontier in order to pay the scattered troops of the regiment. I managed to make the rounds about twice a year. Anyway, on March 6, 1801, the day after I received my letter from Mr. Jefferson, I left the Army Depot in Pittsburgh on my way to Washington, the new federal city. 
The spring rains made the roads a slew of mud, and it took me over two weeks to reach the White House. Mr. Jefferson had gone for a short vacation to Monticello, but he left instructions for me to move into his quarters, where I would receive free food and lodging and a salary of $600 per year, much better than captain's pay, I might add. So I unpacked and tried to get settled before the president returned. Although the program didn't see the light of day until later in the decade, its broad appeal reached a large audience. Children of the U.S. Armed Forces were learning about their country's history in an easy and enjoyable way. At least three years after Horizons West, the Armed Forces Radio and TV Service commissioned a new series produced and directed by Bill Lolly. It was called When the West Was Young. General, I've made my decision. I'm a newspaper man, and I joined this expedition to get a story. If I'm going to get the whole story, I have to see it through to the end. Stand up high and base west, and see their footprints span a continent before you. Footprints that were made when the West was young. Writers William Tunberg and Milton P. Kahn centered the dramatizations around lesser-known people of the Western frontier, like this episode on newsman Mark Kellogg starring Harry Bartell. Mark Kellogg rode with General George Armstrong Custer into the Battle of the Little Bighorn. As the country that is indebted to them. It is May 13th, 1876. It is Saturday in Bismarck, North Dakota. And in the office of the Bismarck Tribune, a man sits at his desk finishing up his copy before the press begins to turn out the next edition. He's a quiet man, middle 30s, but a man with a restless spirit, the urge to be out where things are happening, an urge which will shortly involve him in the most fateful assignment of his life. Listen now as Harry Bartell portrays Mark Kellogg in The Last Dispatch. Yes, Colonel Lounsbury. Uh, will you step into my office for a minute? Yes, sir. Uh, sit down. Yes, sir. Mark, you've been with the Tribune as my editorial assistant since I established it. That's right, three years ago when I first came to Bismarck. Gene Twombly was the sound effects technician. He'd honed his craft on the Gene Autry show, The Whistler, and the Jack Benny program. This can't be a very exciting job for you. Probably Radio sound effects had progressed to the point where transcribed sounds could be laid over recorded dialogue. That's why I got myself on as a part-time correspondent for the Western Associated Press and the New York Herald. Well, something's come up. While the group of West Coast character actors had been appearing together on radio for an entire generation, by 1965, employment opportunities for dramatic radio actors and actresses were all but gone. She must have made 30, 40 films. 50 well, I'll films. tell you what happened. As Herb was saying, in those days, we were very, very, very busy in, in radio. When television came around, all of the writers and producers and directors from radio were the early pioneers of television. Like Jess Oppenheimer was the producer of Lucy. So we knew them all, and they didn't know where to go. And we'd say, hey, you know, how about it? He'd say, yeah, I got something coming up, available next week. So I was very, very busy in the early days of television. No, we just drifted with the people that we knew, and they felt comfortable with us. I'll tell you, one of the saddest days of my life was when they changed from a six-day a week to a five-day a week. The early television shows, most of them would shoot for three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 
Now all of a sudden, there's a five-day week. Now you can't do two shows a week. You can do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Now the Thursday and Friday one's going to carry over to Monday. Now you can't do Monday, Tuesday. Oh boy, that was terrible. <laughs> I, I also think you have to remember the early days of television were half hour cowboy or sitcom. And then they developed, so if you had, let's say, 30 half hours of shows, let's say five shows in one night, seven days a week is 35 shows, okay? Ultimately, they started the live Playhouse 90s, Pontiac Playhouse, Matinee, and so they found the hour format. And then they went to the hour show. So we're talking about now actors and craft, guild people, where there used to be all of these different crews working on all these half hour shows. All of a sudden, one whole crew and one whole bunch of actors cut disappeared, in cut in half. And then ultimately, hour and a half. And then huge sales of motion pictures to television. And you cut those hour and a halves by Boku, and you had nothing. Then the, in the 60s, from 1959, to 1966 or seven or eight, there was a tremendous unemployment. I remember sitting at the Brown Derby with McDonald Carey. We had done a, uh, a Jason, and uh, Ricardo Montalban came by and sat down, and they were talking about how they were being asked to take a cut. This is about 1952 or three that they were being asked to take a cut. The producers already started to cut down on the wage scale. And the scale that Ricardo Montalban was being asked to work for was a scale that I had finally worked myself up to. And I said, holy cow, if, he's, if McDonald Carey and Ricardo Montalban are going to be asked to work for that kind of money, where do I have to go back to the $65 a day well, minimum? And it, boy, it happened. They just went right down the toilet. What I mean, happened is that they used to call these little bits that we played, like uh, that went for a day or two, or were two, three, four pages, they called them cameos, and they'd give them to a star. And they'd give the star like a top salary of $1,000. Uh, $1,000. And, for, and for, you know, we finally worked our way up to two, two three, yeah. four, five hundred dollars a yeah. day. You know, how many days do you work? You don't so work they could that put many. the star's name on the marquee. There's one other thing to answer your question, too. As I said, I was so busy when television started. But suddenly, there was so much television going on out here that the actors in New York started swarming oh. out here. They now, when did. the actors swarmed out here, the directors followed. And when all the directors came out here, they started using the New York actors had been. Their friends and, that they were familiar and with. The, and comfortable the guys with. who had been doing a lot of television, like me, suddenly, it ain't there anymore. Well, yeah. It was a very dry period. That's what right. Herb's talking about. Very dry. It was tough. Yeah. I was lucky to have found cocaine and marijuana, and I was... <laughs>